Hello, welcome to Girls Who Code Q&A. I'm Jessica Zepic, the facilitator. If you're joining us live, please feel free to interrupt at any time, either by unmuting or adding questions into the chat. If you are watching the recording, I'm going to share my email address um, just on the next slide here. Please feel free to email me and reach out with any additional questions that you have. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Hopefully I get them all answered today. Uh, but if not, like I said, we can touch base after the presentation. So I am Jessica Zepic. There's my email address. I am the media STEM specialist at East Elementary. That's in South Madison Community Schools in Pendleton, um, Indiana. I'm also a Keep Indiana Learning digital learning coach. And I don't really have any official affiliation with Girls Who Code, but I do have four years of experience facilitating Girls Who Code clubs here at East Elementary. And so I thought this session would just be helpful for someone who was in my shoes a couple of years ago where I was contemplating possibly starting a club here at school and had some questions. So um, hopefully if you are on the fence, this can kind of help nudge you in the direction that you're looking to go. And please follow me on Twitter. I'd love to connect there on social media as well. So the first question, what is a Girls Who Code Club? Uh, it's a free extracurricular program. It's geared toward girls in grades 3 through 12. And the goal is to just teach participants about computer science in a fun and safe environment. What happens during a club meeting? The participants learn about computer science concepts. They learn to see themselves as computer scientists. They learn about other women and non-binary identifying professionals in the field of technology. They also participate in some sisterhood activities. So it's it's kind of a fun you know, group that gets to meet um, during the school year and they, they form their own little bond of sisterhood through those activities and, and sisterhood um, things that the facilitator runs. I can only speak to the third through fifth grade club. That's the only one I facilitated, but they complete um, unplugged or plugged challenges in Scratch. So Scratch is a coding platform that they use, um, but there's also activities that they could do unplugged for the third through fifth. They also, either the facilitator or the girls themselves, read chapters from Girls Who Code books. And we're gonna take a look at those um, here in a minute. 6th through 12th, I looked on the Girls Who Code website, and uh, they learn a variety of programming languages, including Scratch, Swift, Python, and JavaScript. So it's kind of an elevated um, piece to the Girls Who Code Club for the um, elementary grades. Now, I will speak to one part of this. Um, in our district, we have a breakup of students. They come to the elementary school K through six. So I have had sixth graders join my club and I just still ran the third through fifth curriculum. I could have had the sixth graders do the six through 12 curriculum. I just chose to have them all do the same curriculum. So um, there's some flexibility there. Um, that would be my suggestion. Um, it's probably, you know, either way, either way you wanted to run it. Also, if you had sixth graders in another building, of course, you'd have to think through the logistics of them having transportation to come over to your building. So if you were in an elementary building and your sixth graders were at a middle school, for example, you may, um, you know, bring them over or however you work that out, but just something to think about. That is the grade breakdown, three through five and then six through 12. So what are the Girls Who Code books that are shared? There's Girls Who Code, Learn to Code and Change the World, and then Girls Who Code, The Friendship Code. So The Friendship Code is more of a, a fictional series, um, whereas Girls Who Code is a little more nonfiction-ish. So they're both engaging, the kids love them, they're interesting books. Neither, I've, nev I've not read either book cover to cover during the meetings. Uh, we just focus on chapters. We also, um, I'm the media specialist for our school, so I also got a couple of copies for students to check, check out. So just gives them an introduction to the book during the club meetings. And then a lot of them chose to read it on their own. Like I said, I've done this for four years. Uh, one year, Girls Who Code sent me copies of um, both books for all of my participants at one time. Some years they don't, so that varies. So I can't say for sure whether or not 
a book would be, a physical copy of the book would be sent to you, but those chapters are on the platform, which we'll look at here at the end of the presentation. So you don't have to have, that's not a necessity to have copies of those books. Who can facilitate a Girls Who Code Club? Any adult, 18 or over, <clears throat> who is affiliated with a host organization. So that would have to be a public nonprofit organization. Um, obviously, a school would qualify for that, which is where most of the club facilitators come from, but it doesn't have to be someone, um, you know, a teacher. It can just be someone affiliated with that host organization. So, um, you know, a instructional assistant or an, another employee of the school would qualify there. There are additional requirements I looked up on their website um, that are just a little more specific, but I thought overall, if you're over 18 and affiliated with that host organization, then you are qualified to facilitate a club. How much computer science experience do I need to facilitate a Girls Who Code Club? The great news is none. And I will attest to that. I am not a computer science expert by any means. I do know a little more than I did before I started facilitating Girls Who Code. Uh, but at the time that I started it, I did not have any experience. That was one of the reasons I actually chose to facilitate a club because I wanted to learn more about computer science. Uh, there is a facilitator toolkit that has guided tutorials. So you you don't have to know how to use the Scratch platform. Of course, if you already have experience, that's even better, but you certainly, that is is not a prerequisite to facilitate a club. There are instructions on how to present computer science concepts. So, you know, even if you're unfamiliar with the vocabulary and whatnot that goes along with computer science, um, that is all provided on the platform for you. There are online training webinars and support all throughout the club. So really, it, you know, if you're thinking, well, I'm not a computer science expert, that is okay. Even if you don't have any experience, you could still facilitate a club successfully. Is there a stipend for facilitating a club? I have no but because, and this varies year to year. So some years there has been a club's fund available and some years there's not, and it varies on the amount. So this year we're fortunate enough, clubs with three or more members get a $500 club's fund. I do believe that's the highest amount I've ever gotten to spend. Don't quote me on that, but I feel like in the past it's been about 300. Um, the way they're doing it this year is we just get an Amazon wish list that we get to submit up to $500 and that can be for anything. So me personally, I am going to request snacks just because any club that meets after school that has snacks, kids enjoy. So that's a huge perk for them. So I'll probably buy some snacks and drinks and then some coding materials because you um, can go beyond the curriculum provided in the Girls Who, Cl Girls Who Code um, platform. So I'm going to get some mini Spheros. We're fortunate enough in our library to have some iPads that will run those Spheros so that the girls can practice their coding skills with those as well. So the nice thing about that is that I can use them beyond Girls Who Code. So, you know, you get this money and you get to spend it for Girls Who Code, but then you have materials that you can continue using throughout the school year. So really generous. Again, it's not every year that that's offered. So I'm really excited that that is part of it for this year. Some additional swag. So last year they sent um, a t-shirt and then also a notebook and sticker for all of the girls, which they loved. Uh, the year of COVID, they sent masks and the girls went wild over those. Um, so this year they're, they're doing the free t-shirts, stickers and notebooks again. Again, those are for any club that has three or more registered club members. And those are approved third through fifth or sixth through 12th grade clubs for this um, for this current school year are eligible to get the, the swag. And I will say the process has been super easy to obtain those. I just collect the sizes from the girls. Girls Who Code provides an order form, came to my email. As soon as I have three girls registered, then that comes to my email and I'm able to order the shirts. And everything's been super easy. Shirts are high quality. Uh, I know that the swag can sometimes be a real perk, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. 
Can I charge Girls Who Code members a fee for the club? Uh, no. So Girls Who Code clubs must be entirely free to host and for students to join. So um, again, if you wanted to get additional um, snacks or swag for your members, that's what you would use your club funds for and you, you wouldn't be able to charge the members for that. I see a few people that are popping into our live presentation. So before I go any further, I just want to mention that um, while this is recorded and you can go back and see the recording from the beginning, anytime you want to jump in, if one of the questions leads to another question, please feel free to interrupt me, um, unmute or put it in the chat. I have someone monitoring the chat for me. So um, you're welcome to add questions there as well. But otherwise, I'm just going to continue going through the questions that have been submitted. So how do I get started facilitating a club? So if you're at this point where I'm like, yes, I think I'm going to go for it. Um, my recommendation would be going to the Indiana Department of Education website and search Girls Who Code. I'm actually going to pop out of the presentation and show you what that looks like. Um, because you do want to make sure that your club is affiliated with the IDOE. So um, on their website, they have a whole page dedicated to Girls Who Code. It goes through what that is and, and explains that the IDOE is partnering with Girls Who Code to bring those free computer science opportunities to elementary, middle, and high school girls um, across Indiana. So it gives you a little bit of information, uh, most of all that I've already shared but it shows where you can learn more. So you can sign up for a Girls Who Code webinar where someone who is officially affiliated with Girls Who Code would have additional information. Um, and then it tells you everything that you need to start your club and then a link to apply. And it does note that it's important that you indicate the partnership affiliation on the application so that you can receive those partnership benefits with the idea. So it just um, has that little note to make sure that you do that because you could go to the Girls Who Code website and apply there. Um, but really, we want to make sure that any Indiana clubs are affiliated with our Department of Ed. And it shows um, some Girls Who Code that are already in Indiana. So you can see they're already taken off. And hopefully, some of you joining will be able to add to that map. We have additional clubs in our state. Thank you for your patience while my slides continue to load. My apologies about that. Okay, moving on. What time commitment is required for facilitating a club? Uh, what I love most about Girls Who Code is that that is extremely flexible. It's a facilitator decision. So the suggestion is to have weekly or bi-weekly meetings for one to two hours, and it's strongly suggested to meet for at least 60 minutes, just so you get everything in. You can read the chapters, you can do the sisterhood activities, you can do the coding activities, and really um, 60 minutes is a good time frame to get all of that in. The curriculum is designed for 10 or more meeting sessions, but again, that is completely flexible. I usually do about five to six per year, and I typically try to do it in January or February, um, just because that works with my schedule and our school schedule, but really that is completely flexible. A colleague of mine at another elementary school who also facilitates Girls Who Code, she does it a little bit differently. She does one meeting a month over several months, over you know five or six months. So it's really however it works for you. And I love that flexibility because that is truly a facilitator decision. Um, of course, when you do it the first year, then you can make adjustments for the next year. The first year I started out, I think I did the, the minimum, which was four meetings just to kind of get my feet wet. And then I've extended it from there. But it's, it's great because there is enough curriculum for 10 or more meetings. So if you wanted to have it more often, then the, the material is definitely lends itself to that. What technology is required for Girls Who Code? So the ideal technology would be for your participants to have desktops, laptops, or Chromebooks. 
tablets are possible. The platform doesn't work as nicely with tablets. Phones would not be suitable. So um, you would want to make sure that your participants had that. Now, the third through fifth grade curriculum, um, the technology is not required because they could do those unplugged activities for the duration of the club and never do any of the online um, activities, which would be fine. Just the facilitator would need access to the platform so that the facilitator could get access to the training materials and to be able to register members. But it could be completely ran unplugged. Is there someone from Girls Who Code who can help me as I facilitate my club? The answer is yes. I have screenshot a um, an announcement straight from my email. So it, it lets me know it's almost time for my clubs to launch. There are um, webinars for facilitators. So there are live monthly facilitator trainings. They're an hour long. You can ask questions to someone affiliated with Girls Who Code. They do a great job of answering questions. They allow that um, Q&A time, uh, similar to this, but like I said, they are officially affiliated with Girls Who Code and, and may be able to answer more specific questions. So there are those webinars, facilitator trainings, and then there is actually someone, um, a, a specialist with Girls Who Code assigned to each club so that I have a direct contact with someone. And I have emailed ours uh, several times, not that it's really unclear, but I've just had a couple of questions and they're very responsive, very helpful. And it's just nice to know that there is that person there for support if I need it. Um, so they don't, if you sign up for the club, they don't just say, here are the materials, here's the platform, now go. And um, they, they offer a lot of support and I felt very comfortable even my first year running it. So that is, that's been very nice. Can there be more than one facilitator for a Girls Who Code club? Yes, it's recommended to have at least one for every 20 to 25 students. It's a great way to get more people involved. So if you have, you know, multiple teachers at a building or staff members um, who want to do it, that is great and they can absolutely get on board. Uh, I have an example. So I partnered with Madison County 4-H, the Purdue Extension. And they came and did some coding activities with the Girls Who Code. And I actually made that um, representative from Madison County 4-H a co-facilitator for my club. So, you know, if you can community outreach and find organizations that are willing to partner with you, that is fantastic. But also one facilitator is sufficient as long as you don't have too many students. Um, I did it by myself for the first three years and had no trouble. It's, it's very manageable. The coding tutorials are very student paced. So I didn't feel like I had to give one-on-one -on -one instruction to the students. So it was extremely manageable for just one person, but it's definitely nice to have more involved and you can add facilitators straight to the platform so that they have access to um, everything as well. Where can clubs be held? Uh, public nonprofit locations, even virtual clubs need to identify a nonprofit to service the host. There needs to be internet access. Um, and for the three through five, remember it could be unplugged, but the facilitator would need internet access. So schools, universities, libraries, community centers, um, all of those would be ideal locations. Someone officially affiliated with the organization must serve as a club decision maker. And we'll talk about the difference between facilitators and decision makers, um, but just know that there has to be someone who is officially affiliated with the host organization. Not acceptable would be private homes, corporate offices, basically any for-profit space would not be a, an ideal location and, and not be acceptable for hosting Girls Who Code. Can I change the locations of the club? Yep, the new location just has to meet that same criteria. Can a girl Sue Code Club meet on weekends? Yes, they can run Monday through Sunday, anytime, including summer. And that goes along with that flexibility of the facilitator of being able to decide when, where, how often, um, which, is, which is great. How do I recruit club members? There is a facilitator toolkit, which includes multilingual flyers and posters. There's an info session slide deck. So if you wanted to present that to students or to parents, they have that material for you. You don't have to prepare it. There are also digital brand assets that you can find on the platform as well um, to promote your club. 
some ideas that I have, school newsletter, website, social media, announcements, email distribution, all of those are great ways to um, recruit club members. For me personally, I do a flyer. Um, I fortunately have access to the students when they come to library class. So I usually advertise it there and explain kind of what it is and give this information slash um, permission slip for them to join. Can boys join a Girls Who Code Club? So this question um, gets asked a lot, especially by the boys here at school. So um, here is the Girls Who Code stance on that. Basically, Girls Who Code takes a gender specific approach to programming, considering the biases that might impact their experience. Uh, they're girl focused spaces with curricula centered on women in tech, so girls can imagine themselves in computing roles. All that being said, the programs are designed for female participants, but Girls Who Code encourages uh, welcoming any member who wishes to support the mission to join. And so usually I tell the boys, you know, well, this is geared toward girls. So, um, you know, and we're fortunate enough to have a tech club that in, that is geared toward both genders. So I usually say, you know, Girls Who Code is is centered on it's it's girl focused, but you're welcome to join. And so far, I haven't had any boys who have actually joined. They just kind of grumble when when they see that it's for girls only. Can parents facilitate a Girls Who Code club? So this is the difference between those facilitators and decision makers. So facilitators actually lead students through the curriculum. The decision makers serve as the point of contact between Girls Who Code and the nonprofit organization hosting the club. So a parent could be a facilitator if there is a designated decision maker who completes the club application. So for example, if you are a teacher or a staff member at a school and a parent wants to lead the Girls Who Code Club, then the staff member of the school would need to be the decision maker. And then the parent could be the facilitator who actually leads the club. But a parent cannot on their own facilitate a Girls Who Code Club. Unless you're like me, who is a staff member slash parent, I serve as both roles. Can Girls Who Code clubs meet virtually? Yes, there are synchronous and asynchronous options. Um, back in the 2020-21 school year when it was still, um, you know, COVID heavy and, and we couldn't meet in person, I did re run that club virtually. Um, the facilitator toolkit offers some best practices for virtual meetings and you just have to use your own ver video conferencing platform. So we did it through, um, you know, Google Meets, but that that was able to happen. I didn't run it as long, so it wasn't an hour. It was a, a half hour and then I encouraged the girls to on their own go through the scratch tutorials for the next half hour. So that was the only thing I did differently. Of course, there's a lot of flexibility in that, but they could certainly uh, meet virtually and the materials offered lend themselves to that option well. So if you're thinking about starting a Girls Who Code Club, but you're worried that maybe you can't continue the commitment, um, if you if that happens, you just contact Girls Who Code so they can share open positions with a community of facilitators. But really, it would be best to reach out to your own network and find a new volunteer who meets those facilitator requirements. But again, the the commitment is so flexible that I found it wasn't too scary to start one because I really could start small and kind of grow it from there. Um, but there's no real. I'm like, if you if you stop hosting a club, then your club just ends unless a new facilitator could be found. So how can I learn more about Girls Who Code? If you just go to girlswhocode.com, um, there is a button, get involved. So that would be my suggestion of the first place to start. And are there any other opportunities to be involved with Girls Who Code beyond facilitating a club? And I actually screenshot another email that I received. Um, and this talks about two events that were coming up in November, um, Power On and a Women in Tech talk panel. So the really nice thing about Girls Who Code is they do give other opportunities to be involved just in that, in that movement of, um, adding more women to the computer science field and getting girls interested in that. So um, there are additional opportunities that will come your way if you sign up to be a facilitator. 
So where can I find Girls Who Code materials and resources? So um, you'll, you'll get a login to a platform and I'm gonna go ahead and get out of my presentation and go to my Girls Who Code HQ platform. So this is, you know, notice it shows that I'm the facilitator. There's where that facilitator toolkit is. Then we have the chapter guides for both of the books, the scratch tutorials and um, code at home. So if I open this and before I open that, you'll see that you have the curriculum there, program info, you can manage your members, progress, messages, all from there. So if I open that facilitator toolkit, you'll notice that this makes it really easy for the facilitators. There's a plan your club checklist, um, things that you need to do to prepare uh, to launch your club. There's the webinar um, information, implementation support. There's the club's newsletter, club charter, facilitator, code of conduct, sisterhood activities. So you don't have to come up with those on your own. They already have those ideas there, um, a virtual celebration guide. So all of that is there ready for you. And again, you do not have to have any computer science experience because when the girls start to do the scratch tutorials, it it just leads them through it themselves. So um, did I have girls, do I have girls who ask questions? Yes, but really they're able to figure it out on their own or even better work together to, to problem solve. So it's just been a really positive addition to our school. My own daughter is in fifth grade, um, so she is part of the club. She really enjoys it. And what's nice is once they are in the club, even if it's past your club meetings, if, you're, if your official club ends at your school, they still have access to the platform. So they can continue going in and doing those scratch tutorials and reading the um, chapters of the book on their own, even past the club meetings. So that's all, those were all of the questions that I had. I know we only have a few minutes, so if anyone has additional ones, um, that I haven't covered, please feel free to unmute or we can see if there are any in the chat. Hi, Jessica. We don't have any in the chat, but a question I had, and I don't think you answered prior to a club meeting, how much prep work do you put in? Let's say your club meets on Wednesday. What are you doing Tuesday night or Wednesday at lunch? Or what do you have to do to be ready for club? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the beginning, like the first year, obviously I put in a little more time. I just had to figure out how to navigate the um, website and feel pretty comfortable with that. Honestly, it didn't take me too long. Um, as far as once you get going, there is little to no prep. I mean, oh. it kind of tells you, um, it runs down a list of what to do. Now, because there is so much curriculum, I do have to kind of pick and choose what mm -hmm. curriculum I use. A lot of times I will have girls who return year after year. So I don't, for example, if I'm reading some of the chapters, I don't want to start with chapter one and end on chapter five. And then the next year, start at chapter one, end at chapter five, and yeah. then the, yeah. the same girls are getting the same content, yeah. same with the scratch tutorials. I wouldn't want to use the same scratch tutorials every year. So I do have to kind of plan that out, and I do that before the club starts. Um, so I invite fourth through sixth grade girls. I have invited third grade. Um, that takes a little more involvement as far as um, helping them. So I find that four through six is a really nice group and it keeps my numbers low enough and manageable enough for me to run it myself. Um, so at the beginning, um, because I have many girls who rejoin year after year, I just kind of think through that of I have X number of meetings, so I want to cover these chapters. And really the chapters lend themselves. You can start in the middle of the book and, and you know, that's fine because again, they're just getting kind of a snippet of it and then decide which tutorials and which sisterhood activities to lead to because again, you don't want to run, I personally don't want to run the same sisterhood activities, the same scratch tutorials and the same chapters year after year. It's kind of on a three year cycle. So I did it three years and then I started over this past year because I knew they would be new participants. Yeah. Great Good question. Um, others who are here, feel free. You can unmute your mic or you could uh, put your question in the chat. 
Um, I'll just do a little keep Indiana learning song and dance while people might be doing that. So we appreciate you, Jessica, be doing this today, but here at Keep Indiana Learning, we want to be a resource for teachers of all content areas um, with the professional development that we offer both on demand and on our YouTube channel and through our blogs and our podcasts and our live streams. Wherever you are is where we strive to be. So um, if you have suggestions for content that you're like, mm, I really want to know more about XYZ, um, shoot me an email. Let, let me know what that is and I'll, I'll see what I can find. Maybe something we already have, maybe something we have in the works, or maybe something we haven't even thought of um, because we are a tiny little team trying to cover lots of content areas. Mm -hmm. And the recording of this will be on the YouTube and um, platform, correct? So they can... Yes. They can rewatch it or share it. Please share it with someone yes. else who may be interested. Yes. So I will send an email to all of you who registered for this event. Um, once I have the editing done, I need to edit the front end just a little bit, but it'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, my goal is early next week. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Jessica, I, I guess maybe we should just be quiet for a second. Give people a chance to unmute their mics. I'll grab a drink. <laughs> May I ask a question? Sure. Go for it. And it's going to be um, in regards to um, fees or the lack of, I suppose. Uh -huh. So I fall under an after school program that is operated by a daycare. And I apologize if you answered this already. I came in a little late. And to participate in the daycare programming, the families pay a fee, a weekly fee. So although they're not directly paying for the girls who um, code club, they would still have to pay for the after school programming daycare services. Is that okay? So again, not being um, officially affiliated with Girls Who Code, I would probably double check with them, but I would say that would be okay because they're paying for the daycare services, you're just running the, the club um, in conjunction with that. So me personally, I would think that would be okay. But again, they're really responsive. So if you reached out with that specific question, I'm sure they would be able to um, point you in the right direction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. And I had never thought about that. But what a great um, program to offer inside that wraparound service. So, oh, I love that. Yes, love that. because we do have, you know, kids who stay after school all the time for those after school programs and they could be involved with this and they're already there. So yeah. great idea. Yeah, yeah, love it. Thank you. If you think of a question um, and, you know, it comes to you, I, I know how I, I am. I'm driving home and I have that thought um, and I'm like, so feel free to reach back out to me here at Keep Indiana Learning and I can send it on to Jessica. Jessica's email address is also um, in the presentation. Jessica, would you want to put that up one more time, your I contact can. info? Um, I know you can get a hold of her on Twitter or on email, so um, you could, you know, the power of collaboration and women working together is one of my favorite things. Um, so there, there it comes in a second, maybe. There we go. Um, yeah. So feel free to reach back. Thank you. Um, feel free to reach back out to Jessica, or like I said, you've got my email address as well as I sent you the reminders. Um, and Jessica, we so much appreciate your time here at Keep Indiana Learning. Yep. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, ladies, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at other Keep Indiana Learning events in the future. So have a great evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.